Hello, welcome back to this second plenary session of the morning and second plenary session also by the intimate team. The presentations result from a, from an, an study on friendship and care in trans intimate biographies. And we're going to start with Ana Cristina Santos, who focused in the case of Portugal. Hello again, good morning. In spite of significant changes in recent years, there has been a deficit of visibility for lesbian, gay, transgender, intersex and queer people throughout history. This lack of visibility has led to a deficit of empowering representations of LGBTIQ people. Consequently, the academic lens tends to emphasize uh, victimhood, violence and health problems with a focus on quantitative studies on bullying, suicide attempts and depression. In spite of its importance in raising awareness and triggering legal change, the primary focus on narratives of violence and victimhood hampers the recognition of empowering models that are also constitutive of the experience of LGBTIQ people. Now, this paper seeks to partially address this deficit by placing the role of trans and non-binary persons at the center as agents and not objects in caring for others. By doing so, we suggest to turn around the dominant imaginary of trans people as victims and people in need of care, material, emotional, health, etc., so that they are recognized as fundamental elements in the network of provision of support in the context of growing precariousness and retraction of the state. This inversion of the analytic paradigm about trans and non-binary persons will be done through the theme of care, using it as an entry point to suggest care as an heroic act in everyday life and to inquire about the cis normativity underlying the imaginary of the hero. Now, within the broader field of studies of the heroic, the figure of the national hero has been analyzed as part of the discourse that reconstructs the, na the nation as a myth, defining itself through values such as courage, determination, physical strength. Such attributes are constitutive of the dominant paradigm of etro cis masculinity. But one aspect hardly addressed is that of the homogeneity of the hero. Indeed, national heroes are often similar, surprisingly homogeneous, in an objectively impossible way. In the context of Southern Europe, at least, all heroes who are not the exception that confirms this rule are white, young, heterosexual cisgender men with pro proven physical and psychological strength without disability or chronic illness. It might be suggested that the imaginary around the hero is indebted to eugenics. Many questions could be asked now. How can the nation accept to represent itself with such a reductive image? To what extent does the representation of the national hero contribute to a, an exclusionary form of citizenship? What are the heroes that we do not talk about? Where are they? How do they represent themselves? Who silences them? Is there room to recognize the micropolitics of heroism in everyday life? What mechanisms work so that some models of heroism are allowed to represent the community while others remain dismissed as abnormal, dangerous, discredited, strange or monstrous? And where are trans and non-binary people at this crossroads between heroism, body and diversity? To what extent are trans and non-binary people examples of heroism? In short, through the way the heroic body is constructed, trans and non-binary people seem to be excluded from the representation of heroism. And yet, through the dominant transphobia, it is tra trans and non-binary people who, in daily life, face strong threats to their integrity, committing micro-acts of resistance that alone could constitute heroic acts. Therefore, it would be useful, perhaps, to review the concept of heroism. The ability to render aid in situations of adversity constitutes a central element of what is defined as an heroic act. Indeed, the etymological origin of heroism stems from the Greek word heros, which means protector or defender. So in this paper, I suggest that we think of care as an heroic act, 
especially in contexts where, through increasing precariousness, both the state and families fail in social protection. In this sense, in Southern Europe, welfare society is strongly anchored in networks of friendship, constituted also by trans and non-binary persons for whom the bonds of friendship were often the only means of salvation that first and foremost allowed them to survive. The interviews included in this paper were conducted in Lisbon with trans men and non-binary people, again, self-identified as such, between 25 and 45 years old, and with a mixed socioeconomic background that combined a high level of education <coughs> with um, um, incomes which were below 500 euros monthly. The method followed was biographical and narrative interpretive method, and the decision to focus this paper on the narrative of, of, um, of trans uh, men and non-binary people is political and aims to compensate for the weight that the feminization of care presents in sociological literature, allowing one to study the intersection between non-normative masculinities and care delivery. From the analysis carried out, um, we identified three main types of care, intersubjective care, bodily and clinical care, and care in daily management. So going to the first one. Intersubjectivity can be defined as the ability to relate. In the interviews, intersubjective care often took the form of welcoming, not judging, putting people at ease, forming solidarity. One of the interviewees said, I have a friend who is cis and hetero, but people are always ridiculing her about her hairstyle, and she is alcoholic and ashamed, but she is not ashamed around me. I do not judge, you know, it's these things that are very important to me. I feel it's my responsibility to help as I can. Me can non-binary uh, in that age group, as you can see in the slide. Also, Ricardo, non-binary, he says, my grandmother went to the hospital and it was very bad. So I went to visit her. I think I asked her if she wanted to pray because I know it's an important thing for her. We were praying to our guardian angel. And then she taught me again for a long time. I had no longer remembered. We stayed a little while to pray. She started to do things and then sometimes she forgets. And then we remembered and I am there. In these examples, intersubjective care focuses on the ability to provide support in situations of vulnerability by suspending value judgments. Such non-judgmental capacity can be interpreted as a result from the incorporation of experiences of discrimination, leading to an empathic positioning. Through intersubjective care, we can return to the definition of transgender proposed by Jack Olberstam that suggests trans as a relational form the relationality that a trans body uh, represents leads us to the idea of an alliance with other precarious existence, existences, recognizing a body that is, after all, a collective, a body in alliance, as Judith Butler points out. Along these lines, relationality as a marker of a collective trans identity extends to the understanding of care as a relational practice. And in fact, this care relationship involves agents who do not necessarily inhabit the inner circle of intimacy, as we shall see in the next uh, case of bodily and clinical care. Under this designation, practices of support to other trans and non-binary persons are grouped in relation to technical knowledge about the body, hormonal treatment, and healthcare. Learning to bind one's breasts or to use makeup in drag workshops, for example, are forms of help provided by trans people to other trans people in our study. Information about the professionals facilitating a diagnosis and access to hormone treatment or detailed knowledge about the impact of medication in libido, for example, are also areas of intervention described by our participants. Clinical care also includes the provision of help to health professionals who are unfamiliar with transgender, but nonetheless demonstrate um, willingness to learn. So Ugo, uh, self-identified as a trans man, 
says, I felt that, um, so I started to also be a support for other people because what a person does from the beginning is to look for a lot of information in very different sites and many different types of information. A support that I curiously feel almost always end up providing is the support that is given to the doctors, whether they sense they are being supported or not. For these health professionals, trans people are fundamental and irre irreplaceable sources of information because they have a specialized and in-depth knowledge of the experiences they go through, obviously, and this has been pointed out by Zoe Davy and Lucas Platero in their studies. Moving to the last um, type of care identified in, in my study. The management of daily, daily life is done through support networks, often constituted in the context of friendship. For instance, logistical support that includes preparing meals for another person, um, paying bills uh, for an unemployed roommate, taking care of their pets, cleaning the house, grocery shopping, or taking an elderly person to a medical appointment, amongst other examples. So, uh, Ugu uh, describes the situation in relation to his uncle, and he says, I've been a permanent support on several levels, from dealing with medication, doing those things you see in ads for geriatric assistance, basically these things of sorting out medication, going to the pharmacy, doing something here or there, taking him to the doctor, and also taking him to the gymnastics class when, when he needs it. This paper focused on what we call the micropolitics of heroism in everyday life, and more specifically on the status of a hero caregiver understood as someone who provides basic care for the well being of others. By recognizing altruistic practices of resistance to adversity through the provision of help, we find space to accept care as an heroic act. The decision to place care on the same symbolical level of heroism is particularly significant in contexts where, for reasons of transphobia and growing precariousness, both the social state and families fail in their, in their protective function. It should be noted, however, that this decision is not intended to support a simplistic view of trans or non-binary persons who would then be placed on one of two opposing poles on the spectrum from victim to hero. Reported experiences and lived lives we know are largely complex and dynamic, and there are many examples of resistance to the role of the victim that do not necessarily go through a search for an heroic place. The experiences reported in this paper are relevant to the intersection between transgender studies and studies on care. Care has always been a central concept for feminist and gender studies, we know. Moving toward the themes such as the ethics of care, to the claim of care as unpaid work, gender and feminist studies ended up contributing to the crystallization of the caregiver as a cisgender woman, often within an heteronormative and reproductive framework, failing to consider the transformation of the intimate sphere in the contemporary. The experiences of trans and non-binary persons in relation to care provision interrupts this dominant narrative produced from a longitudinal model of care and invites us to rethink the tacit or explicit links between gender, domesticity and care. Throughout the five-year period of the Intimate Project, only in the studies on the centrality of friendship and care networks for transgender people was it possible to identify narratives of autonomous recognition and appreciation of the role of the LGBTIQ person or placing at the center of analysis individual agency as a generator of well-being and source of empowerment in the, se in the sense of self-determination. In Portugal, as in the Spanish and Italian contexts, we collected stories of care for elderly people, especially family members, parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, but also care for other transgender people and people in precarious work situations, suffering economic and emotional insecurity. The life histories that we have um, gathered in the Portuguese context cannot but be interpreted in the light of a strong family-oriented Southern Europe, where the informal care network aims to fill the flaws of a welfare state, 
of a retracting social state more recently. Among the interviewees, we also had examples of assistance given by transgender people to healthcare professionals who were unaware of important aspects of clinical and or psychological support for trans people. But in parallel to the biographical accounts we have recorded, it is important to recognize the stories that we have not collected, including support for children of trans and non-binary people, for example. The stories that we have encountered and those that remain untold prove the conceptual and political relevance of continuing the work on this topic, placing the analytic, the analytic emphasis on the agency of trans and non-binary persons. In the same year that, as a result of the concerted work between politicians, academics and activists, Portugal approved the remarkable law of gender identity that almost in full respects self-determination, the people who participated in this study are representative of heroes and heroines in the closet of silence for the transphobia that characterizes many of our political and cultural practices. This is also why the experiences of trans men and non-binary people constitute a fundamental political platform for sociological rethinking the concepts of care, masculinity, heroism and corporal dissidence within the framework of intimate citizenship in Southern Europe. Thank you. Now we are moving to, to Spain, to the Spanish context, with a presentation by Luciana Moreira. Okay, thank you. Throughout their lives, from the beginning of a process of self-identification, which is then gradually transposed into different personal and social realms, Trans people are often forced to distance themselves from their family and friend-based care networks, and this because of a sense of rejection. This lack of support also extends to an institutional level in relation to health care or juridical recognition, uh, for, for example. Trans people as a collective, but also within their intimate lives, have been creating new networks of support, reinventing concepts of care and family putting themselves at the forefront of a deconstruction of established social and gender norms. It is my purpose here to use and problematize Manuel Castell's conceptualization of the contemporary network society, in which technologies have a fundamental place in the creation and maintenance of networks. To the author, a network society is a society whose social structure consists of networks powered by microelectronics-based microelectronics-based information and communication technologies. More specifically, the concept serves as a starting point for evaluating the, the virtual and real networks, real like face-to-face, -face, in which trans people participate. How do, how do new technologies enable the creation and maintenance of support and care networks within and beyond the trans community? To what extent does contemporary society allow the creation of networks that are more independent of traditional structures? And what tensions can arise between those networks and society in general? And I'm already cutting. <laughs> Dean Spade. <laughs> Dean Spade, in his book Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics and Limits of Law, identifies and analyzes the causes of the structure, insecurity and shortened lifespans that trans people have to face. To the author, one of the decisive causes of the structural violence identified is population management, which refers to the pervasive kind of power that distributes life chances across population which are usually interven interventions undertaken through the logic of promoting the health or security of the nation. In fact, the very process of pathologizing trans people turns them into social others, those who do not fit and must therefore be cured. Access to health care is presented as being necessary to improve the well-being of the transgender person and at the same time to tame the bodies as much as possible so that gender binarism is not too undermined. Something that could be seen as a neutral policy aiming only to promote well-being and to protect trans persons is, in, in the end, 
a strategy to ensure the cis-gendered uh, social order. But even the criteria of well-being is not free of tensions, since the access of trans people to the health system is often characterized by humiliations, obstacles, invasive questions, denials of access to desired treatments, because people are not considered men or women enough, whatever that means. According to the INSPADE, these and other mechanisms distribute life chances that do not take into consideration each individual promoting, rather, the maintenance of a specific order where wealth, class, race and gender play a central and determining role. In fact, the implications of this population management are not new, with many people feeling the impact of a lack of more fairly distributed opportunities. And at this point, I return to Manuel Castells and the concept of networked society. Indeed, it was the fieldwork I carried out with trans people in Madrid that allowed me to identify precisely the importance of virtual spaces as zones of resistance to disciplinary power and the domestication of bodies. At least in the Western world, it is relatively difficult to be oblivious to the internet, to social networks, to electronic devices that connect people and that provide us with platforms permitting the creation of group and or a route of access to other people with common interests or characteristics, thus creating interconnected networks. Despite provoking criticism, a fair criticism, the present liberal and global system in which we live, characterized by Castells as the network society, has also allowed the creation of microzones less susceptible to contemporary modes of social control. Though so personal, including face-to-face -face support networks, social networks, the use of electronic devices, and sometimes the intersection of all three, trans people have been able to create spaces of resistance to an oppressive system, to gather knowledge and share it, to care for others and provide help, thereby strengthening themselves and resisting atrocist normativity in a society where, as denounced by Spade, opportunities are controlled and trans people face many difficulties that prevent them from living a good life. And I recall here Judith Butler and the question article, can one live a good life in a bad life? And I will briefly present the interview, is okay? Um, they were all collected in Madrid, in Spain, in 2017, and they um, answer to a call of our, where we were searching about trans people um, and interested in networks of care. So these people uh, write us because they saw the, the call, okay? I don't have tables, I have a lot of text, sorry. <laughs> I, I cannot put people in small boxes <laughs> and I'm not a society. <laughs> um, Violetta, the, the, they are all um, anonymized, of course. Some of them choose their own names for anonymization and others, no. Violetta is a student in her late twin, twins, um, teens identifies as a bisexual woman and lives with her parents. Her support network is composed of her parents, her boyfriend, some friends, and the Madrid Community Care Program for the LGBTI population, as well as the Barcelona Program for Trans Persons. Leo identifies as male and straight. He's in his early 20s and attends a professional course. Uh, it's a adult course. His classmates, a former teacher, other friends, and his mother and sister are part of his care network. But unfortunately, even for economical reasons, he lives with his father, who does not accept his gender identity and addresses him in the feminine. <coughs> May is a lesbian woman in her late 20s. She lives with her mother and her sister, who support her, and she also describes the Community of Madrid LGBTI program, along with other NGOs, uh, collective groups, as forming part of her support network. Salvador is a non-binary pansexual person in his early 30s who chooses to, address, um, to be addressed and referred to in the masculine. His parents failed to support him economically and emotionally when he came out as a lesbian 10 years ago. He shares an apartment and his network mainly consists of friendships and trans support groups. And he runs a small precarious company, but he can live with it. Josh is a Latin American trans bolero in his late 30s, and I use the term bolero because it's the masculine word for bolera, the um, Spanish word for dyke. 
He has little contact with his family of origin because of his gender identity. But on the other hand, it was well accepted at his workplace and he was very happy with it. He lives with a friend and is very close to an ex-girlfriend. He also refers to trans collectives as part of his network. Okay. In fact, to a greater or lesser ex extent, all five interviewees referred to the importance of the internet or of uh, virtual networks in searching for information on trans issues, sharing knowledge and experiences, meeting people, establishing friendships. The ability to gather people in a WhatsApp group, a social network, or a mailing list brings to, together what is being called trans knowledge that can be more easily shared. Trans people take, cha take charge of the information in circulation and are no longer at the, at the mercy of doctors or other institutions seeking to control population. Facebook groups may be secret or closed. WhatsApp and Facebook groups are managed by the parties in question so that information flows easily between participants who are at the same time protected from other hostile groups. For example, for Violeta, the information acquired through trans people studying health has been very important. She comments on how they share information with other more vulnerable trans people or those who simply seek more reliable information. And I quote her. So, it's a result of academic education because the transgender population has more and more access to university training. I have contact with trans girls who have studied biomedicine or pharmacy, for example, and they have searched for their own bibliographical references, their own studies, because there are very few endocrinological studies and the few that exist have been the object of searches by these people in order for them to have the safest medication options. In my case, for example, in contrast to what the endocrinologist of the Social Security Office proposed, I've been given the option of requesting injectables from abroad in transit, which is where I'm going to be treated. Likewise, the experts I interviewed, uh, two experts in, in Spain, both activists and trans persons. One is a uh, sexologist engaged in a political party and the other is a social worker, mentioned the association that Violeta refers transit as a very reliable one. Transit is a free service supported by the Catalan Institute of Health and which offers health, health advice and information about endocrinology, gynecology, wherever you want, to trans people. It doesn't matter where people are from. They are supposed to be in Spain, but I know there are people from abroad also emailing them. Um, they just need to, to email. It's not necessary to have a diagnosis, and it does not matter at what stage of transition a person is, or if the person really intends to start something. And I quote Violeta again. I'm doing everything by email with transit from Barcelona. Well. Personally speaking, I've also found their manner to be very good. Because unlike most endocrinologists or professionals who treat trans people, their first questions were, well, their first premises regarding the treatment were, you choose the rhythm, you choose what changes you want. Well, the first question was, with what name do you want to, do you want us to address you and what gender? <coughs> Indeed, there are many references to the importance of social networking and contact with other trans people that the interviews could not have otherwise known or heard about. Searching for and sharing information on health issues were the most frequently mentioned activities. This, however, is not necessarily a new phenomenon, as several previous studies have already shown that, and I quote Zoe David, hi Zoe, uh, that clinical encounters are limited in not fully accounting for the multiple ways that trans people live or have lived their lives. End of quote. Several interviewees shared their fears, recalling countless stories of humiliation, halted processes, and long delays in gaining access to desired treatments. Furthermore, the, ser the search for information online also plays an important role for people who decided not to go through the processes defined by medical protocols and who instead choose independently the changes to be made upon their bodies. That was the case with Josh, who did not need clinical services for anything other than a mastectomy. He told me how he chose the doctor to perform the procedure. I chose that doctor by searching the internet watching a lot of YouTube videos. A lot of people commented, well, 
I have operated with this doctor, I have operated with that doctor, and this name came up a lot, a lot. And I saw the results. Definitely the operation that this doctor did, I mean, I saw the guys who had surgery with this doctor, and he does it very well. And there were others that were terrible. It's like, oof, well, no, I'll find this one. He does it very well, so that's why. All because of YouTube. The use of the internet goes beyond the search, beyond the search for technical or, sp or specialized information. The interviews uh, were also part of Facebook or WhatsApp groups, which serve as platforms for emotional or support, care, or which simply facilitate contact with other trans people. These groups work locally, by city, or by bringing people of a certain age together, or by gathering mainly non-binary people, or trans women, or other specific groups. Salvador, for instance, told me about a group for younger trans people living in Madrid. This group, I mean, it's not that it's a group in itself. What happens is that several of us, all trans, coincided in a number of different activities. And in one of these activities, those, we said that we are going to set up a WhatsApp group. In other words, in the WhatsApp group, it's automatic. A person says, is anyone free? I'm having a bad time and that kind of stuff. And it takes five minutes for someone to answer. And we make a plan and go out. Or if you can't, you say, look, I can't, but cheer up. If you want, we can talk on the phone. There is another kind of availability. I don't want to say by any means that other friendships are not there, but they are, but they are there in a different way. In the end, you are on a different wavelength, even if you don't want to. But if social networks are not friendly, managed by or for trans um, or trans friendly uh, people, they can also obviously be a source of, ex of exclusion, functioning in this case as an instrument to maintain the dominance normative logic and blocking uh, life chances. And this was the case for me, who seemed to have found work through an online job jobs network, but when she clarified that she was a trans person, the established contacts were abruptly cut. Fortunately, sometimes later, May attended a workshop that aimed to prepare LGBT plus people at risk of social exclusion for the job market, and she was lucky enough to get a traineeship. And I quote her, another company from my sector was also very interested in me. They contacted me through LinkedIn and at the time my LinkedIn profile had my old photo and my old name. What happened? They were very interested in me for a whole week and, like, and then when I told them that I was a trans person, they stopped giving signs of life. Later, I participated in a workshop of labor insertion in a LGBT association organized by the company Accenture, in which they taught us to do CVs, some networking, to use LinkedIn, info jobs, and other sites. We did interview simulations to see what we could improve or when interviewed. I, sh I should say that this company also has a diversity program. What does that mean? That that they also have a company policy in which they try to hire LGBT people who are at risk of social exclusion, which is my case too. It is really, really quite encouraging that there are still companies that can look out for the collective a bit. And today I'm doing the training and in the future I'll be incorporated into this company. And this was actually true because she later told me. Um, these examples illustrate how the virtual world, the internet and various types of so social networking has made it easier for trans people to look after themselves by accessing more information, allowing them to decide what to do or not to do with their identities and their bodies. In addition, people also establish networks of support and mutual care, as well as groups in which to seek help for themselves. Information and care networks consist of huge instruments with with which to resist medical and administrative violence towards trans people. They also work towards positive social change, albeit still small, to that normative distribution of opportunities denounced by Spain. But, also as Castles reinforces, online interaction do not replace face-to-face -face interactions. On the contrary, they complement each other and virtual networks, or some of them, are often found to move from the virtual world to the real world and vice versa a fact which also came to be detected in the narratives of the interviews 
for whom their most important friends almost always represent a physical and emotional contact. And I will just give you some examples. Um, this is uh, Salvador again. We use these groups, but in the end, it's important to see each other in person because it's true that technologies help, but it's not like going to events. Well, I know that social activities or COGAM or the Community of Madrid LGBTI program is how I'm getting to know people. In fact, there are people that I have as friends on Facebook and I do not meet them until when we see each other there. Because there are people who love having you on Facebook but who are afraid of meeting you. But if they know you, it's something else. It's just another different example. If I had not had the classmates, and this example is Leo, it's the first time I'm using him. It's about uh, the situation in his school. Um, even if Madrid community has a very uh, friendly um, legislation where schools should um, accept the um, social name to say it, this uh, Leo was facing a different uh, difficult difficulties in this school, but he was supported by his classmates. If I had not had the classmates that I had, I would have left. I would have been another case of school absenteeism. I defended myself, but there was also protection of their part, right? And it was all adult people. Yes, it's true that there are repercussions for them too. Either you want it or you don't. Either you are on one side or you are on another. They, like me, have not received the report card when they should. They have not been informed of much of the course information when the tutor obligation is to inform them. They have been named as a problematic class. Supporting me is also having an impact on their internships because many obstacles were put between them and the places they had chosen. Okay, and the, uh, the last one which I want to read, just to conclude, I would like to bring to your attention a major exponent of the importance of the internet and social media to transnational initiatives concerning trans people. The international campaign Stop Trans Pathologization an, an initiative that mobilizes activists across the globe. It was uh, with different local um, based country um, moments. So, However, the local Spanish examples that I analyzed here also show how trans people are doing it for themselves and how virtual and real care networks may be a strong instrument for democratizing access to neutral information that does not insist on normative juridical and medical impositions. Internet and electronic devices and the flow between these and face-to-face -face friendship networks provide trans people with a support infrastructure that manages reliable knowledge, material resources and care networks that allow people to fight even more against hostile contexts. All those intersected trans pathways are creating more and more possibilities for a critical trans resistance. Thank you. Thank you very much for sticking to the planned uh, schedule. And now we're going to continue with a presentation by Tatiana Motero, who is going to focus on the Italian case. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, so, as the title says, uh, I will begin by talking about Oscar, more precisely, Flavio Oscar. Flavio is one of the persons I interviewed for my research. He's a heterosexual trans man between 40 and 40 years of age. Like all other participants, he is white, able-bodied, born in Italy, and he was living in Rome, uh, like the others, when I interviewed him. During his interview, uh, he told me he wanted to tell his three nieces uh, about his transition. The oldest niece remembered she had an aunt, and then, Flavio says, at one point, she was told by her parents that that aunt was gone and that now there was an uncle. Flavio thinks that in every relationship, what really matters is the truth of yourself. So he felt the need to tell her his story. And here comes the scar. He says, uh, we should go to the seaside together and my body tells my story. And the girls immediately ask, what are those scars? The story is there, so we will have to give an answer. As you can imagine, he's talking about the scars that uh, top surgery left on his chest. 
I found uh, Flavio's narrative around these cars illuminating. They are not only the starting element of his story, of his account, but also an element of visibility, who will at last be totally uncovered for the first time. Uh, what gets uncovered are materially the marks that a process left behind and symbolically the results of that process. Flavio challenges his sister-in-law negative narrative about a trans experience. Uh, she doesn't want to talk to, to her daughters about it because she depicts it exclusively as a painful process, so that in her vision, scars are signs and sites of pain. On the contrary, Flavio intends his own scars as representative of a positive process, a happy ending story where pain became happiness. And this interpretive difference is where his story is made too. I would like to keep this example as a metaphor of trans experiences as they were depicted in my interviews. I want to give visibility not only to the experience of vulnerability, pain and oppression that obviously my participants, as many other trans people, faced, but above all to the different strategies of reaction they use in front of such vulnerability and oppression. These persons carry physical and symbolic scars but they re-signify those scars, they can be proud of them, and they have the tools to get over the painful story of those scars. As we will see, such tools are mainly networks of mutual care, friendship, affection, and so on. In the next minutes, uh, following my participants' stories, I will depict a sort of sequence that recalls the hypothetical path that a trans person may follow at some moment in their life from self-reflection to the medical or legal process for gender recognition. I don't want to uh, typify this path as the example of trans experience. It is just a possibility which incidentally, incidentally resembles the experience of some uh, participants too. So as we saw, uh, Flavio wants to be intelligible to the people he loves, sharing his story with them. Other participants also recall the importance of sharing their stories, but they share them with other trans people, and their aim uh, is being intelligible to themselves first. Indeed, their position of vulnerability here has to do with the idea of being the only one living that kind of experience, so they look for help and support, and this is the first step of the path. The first example comes from Bibi, a lesbian trans woman between 40 and 45, who, was two who has two daughters from a previous heterosexual marriage with a cis woman. Uh, she defines herself also as dead trans woman. She told me, I started joining some uh, groups on Facebook, uh, online groups here, it's also very important, and there I started making friends uh, with some people who are still like me at an early stage of trying to understand. So I understood that there are so many ideas of transsexual people and it helped me to understand that I was not the only one who was transsexual and homosexual. And then she told me about her two daughters because one of her preoccupations was protected, protect them. She told me, my two daughters, I wanted to understand how not to put them in danger because of their friends, their friends' parents, their schoolmates. So I mainly read stories from other parents, both F M2F and F2M. Silom, a pansexual, genderqueer person between 30 and 35 years of age, had the same experience with, uh, with other kind of Facebook groups, made by and for non-binary and genderqueer people, where they felt at ease and protected from the transnormative attacks they received in other groups. Uh, she told me, as long as something remains in your head, you do not feel it as real, in my opinion. Then, when you talk to other people and you realize that there are people like you, then you understand that, yes, I exist, and you legitimate yourself, in a certain sense. In these not just virtual networks, sharing experiences, knowledge, tools, is part of a broader practice of care, a care that is always mutual, reciprocal. So the following steps then are to gather knowledge and information from other trans people that already had direct experiences, to get emotional and material care, and to give it back to others. Penelope, after telling me about the most difficult moments of her recent past, when the support of her online friends was fundamental for her to keep going on, 
She also told me about her present involvement with support to suicidal people. The mutual value of care emerged as a common feature among participants. In different ways and forms, everyone talked about not only how they had been taken care of, but also how they did care, take care of other trans people, or their families, or their friends. Care also comes from the people we already know and love, uh, that already are part of our lives. And for this further step, uh, I go back to Bibi, since I really like this part of her account. Talking about friendship, she said, I don't know if I could call them friends, but anyway, within the family context, they were the first people who supported me, my two daughters. And one example of uh, such support is this. Uh, they always call me dad anyway, but they inflect it as feminine. Uh, my younger daughter, we were having lunch with some friends, and this child said, but how is it a female dad? There are no female dads. Yes, my dad is a female, so they exist. And she always corrects my parents when they use the masculine with me. Uh, I like the fact that uh, she talked about her daughters as friends because they were the ones that supported her the most, contrary to her parents. Uh, Max, a uh, pansexual trans man uh, who self defined as a, 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 a typical male between 25 and, no, a, a typical one word, non typical male between 25 and 29. Uh, he doesn't receive any kind of support from his family of origin, but he feels he, feels he has another family. He, he said, I had just quit my job and I didn't have the money for testosterone. And two friends of mine, Francesca and Anna, gave me the money. They were a support that is family, total support. Friend, friends for me are a family. With them I leave the familial dimension. In every fundamental steps of this transition, Francesca and Anna were there for support, but also for protection. They are my family at a very emotional level. Max identifies two dimensions of care that is supposed to come from a family, material and emotional support. He told me that his family of origin doesn't understand no support in transition, that they misgender him, and that his, his sister refused to return him some money because he wanted to use it for the transition process. His other family, his friends, are the ones who give, uh, who give him that kind of care. And now we get to the next and, and final step, a central issue for many trans people, the medical legal process, which ironically produces more vulnerabilities. But before I go on with this, let me briefly resume the Italian legal situation with regard to trans people rights. Um, uh, Act 164 of 1982, uh, he, its title is Rules Concerning the Rectification of Sex Attribution, was one of the first European laws on the matter, a very important achievement for trans rights. Even if the law doesn't explicitly do it, the tribunals have always demand, uh, demanded, de, uh, demanded genital surgery in order for trans people to get legal gender change. In 2017, the Constitutional Court officially stated that surgery is not, is not mandatory, uh, but anyway, the law implies the pathologi pathologization and medicalization of, of trans people with a long, very long and difficult process from psychotherapy to, tri to tribunals. As Antonia Caruso, uh, a trans feminist activist, wrote, Whatever they do, the trans person must always take charge of the legal procedures that add to the already long bureaucratic process necessary to start a hormone therapy, require any surgical operation, such as mastectomy or sex reassignment, or even just legal gender change. Moreover, according to the law, medical assistance during the transition should be covered by the public health system, but in practice, the whole process can be very, very expensive. Finally, the concrete experiences of many people show how the medical legal system and its gatekeepers reproduce an extremely stereotyped idea of gender. Indeed, both Max and Penelope deplored the strict and rigid binary and cis heteronormative approach of the professionals they met. Uh, I'm talking about health professionals that work in specialized public centers for trans health during the transition process. Uh, Penelope here 
uh, begins uh, by talking about hormone therapy uh, and then gets to the legal issue too. She says, there are methods that can make people feel good right from the start. Methods that are perhaps also reversible. Yet it's taken for granted that everyone must really try to need all this. That is, you really have to get there and prove that you are worthy of facing the path. It's somewhat, a, it's a somewhat as the fact that, that we must prove to a judge that we are really who we are. We are not free. We are not free to self-determine ourselves. It is a judge who has to decide it for us. Uh, as Austin H. Johnson writes, legal transition relies on an essentialist narrative of knowing one is transgender, not choosing to transition. So trans transgender people are subject to a stringent set of criteria that is designed to determine the legitimacy and authenticity of individuals' transgender identities. Max is too is deeply aware of this issue. This is what he told me. The test they do, they ask you, how do you masturbate? Do you like men or women? Do you dress like this or like that? I actually cheated them all. He said manipul manipulare, manipulate, but I don't know if in English it, it was the right way. I had already studied all those tests, so I knew how I had to answer. But if I had told them that my experience is both feminine and masculine, they would have never let me start the transition. According to them, if you are F2M, you must like women, you must dress in a certain way, you must not use makeup, you must completely reject your genitals, you must necessarily want to do surgery or take your breasts off. I cheated the tests all the way through in order to give them what they wanted and to have what I wanted. I found his experience a very interesting example of reappropriation of the medical expert language, which is a very common practice among trans people. In his case, the knowledge that permits him to manipulate, cheat the psychiatric tests come from his studies because he studied psychology. But according to academic and activist literature, what usually happens is a, a horizontal sharing of information. It happened indeed with Penelope, who gathered all her medical knowledge and practical information on hormones from online groups and through her foreign friends. Valentina Coletta, a trans activist I interviewed as a key expert, also told me, I said myself, thanks to word of mouth with other non-binary people, but also with other trans-binary people. Zoe Dewey <laughs> talks about stage managing to describe the respondents a ritualistic, uh, lengthy and patronizing processes involved in persuading, in persuading their psychiatrists that they are legitimate candidates for hormonal and surgical intervention. And very interesting, interestingly, Calorgero Giametta describes a similar strategy when talking about LGBT asylum seekers in the UK. Indeed, according to his research, gender and sexual minority asylum claimants and refugees learn by themselves or through information sharing with others how to answer during interviews at the home office and in tribunals in front of expectations that are absolutely cis heteronormative and stereotyped. As a result, he writes, the nuances of gender and sexual self-understandings remain silenced because of the asylum claimant's fear of not being recognized as an authentic LGBT person. Propping up, medical discourse tries to shape trans persons as perfectly gendered subjects in order for them to fit exactly into socially expected gender norms. Max's and Penelope's examples give us an idea of how this system can be damaging for many trans people. Obviously, there are also many other trans people that perfectly fit into this path, but we cannot forget that such system produces a differentiation between acceptable and deviant subjects, excluding the latter from full citizenship. And let's not forget, too, that class is also strongly implied here. Moreover, even trans people that fit more at ease with this path usually uh, end up employing the same strategies of uh, reappropriation because nobody can be uh, like uh, this kind of uh, binary uh, system uh, wants us to be. I consider that the accounts about some participants' encounters with public health services perfectly illustrates how, in front of a 
still extremely normative medical legal system, agency can be deployed in many different ways. Cheating psychiatric tests, omitting information that could give a not enough normative idea of genders, resorting to private health professionals, if you can, and so on. Thanks to my interviewees, I could observe how different kinds and levels of collective mutual support when, where one is never just either cared for or caring for, stand at the roots of a broader and creative resistance to an oppressive context. Sharing knowledge, information, experiences, helping and caring for each other, even at a virtual level, are fundamental means of empowerment and resistance. These relationships carry a political value and they illustrate, in my opinion, a wider multifaceted flow of resistance where one of the most apparent skills is being able to recognize and interpret normative and oppressive systems and finding ways to get the most of them without bending to their standards. I would like to conclude, my, uh, uh, I would like to conclude with some open questions. A self-reflection on the researcher's body, my body, in fieldwork. As a lesbian, pansexual, transfeminist, cis woman with a non-normative gender expression interviewing trans persons. I started thinking about it before the research began. And then in fieldwork, I felt bad and a bit guilty uh, when during a meeting a trans woman told something about uh, academics studying us and then talking about us from the outside. I often found myself pondering about how my body influenced the interactions I had. I mean, what meaning did my unshaven legs assume in trans context? Was I read as a trans feminist lesbian who rejects some aesthetic impositions due to the gender that was imposed on her at birth? or as a gender fluid person? How did I take advantage of this aesthetic? And how did I read myself in those moments and places? Where is the boundary between an academic who speaks about them and militant ally who speaks with them or with us? Between butchy lesbian who occasionally participates in drag king workshops and trans or gender fluid person? Some of these reflections were further incited by a conversation with a participant who somehow encouraged me to define myself as trans. In addition to confusing me a bit, this episode, I think, shows how investigation can affect us in different ways. As Alba Pons Rabasa and Eleonora Garosi wrote, hace falta pensarnos desde los trans para estudiar los trans and I try to translate, it is necessary to think of us, to think us from the trans in order to study the trans. Finally, my never-ending self-reflections also evolved through endless conversations with very patient, patient trans, trans and cis friends and comrades. Some of them are here, Bea, Yadri, uh, all, of, all of them are here almost. And, um, and this also shows how networks and friends have a fundamental role for the construction of our researches themselves. And of papers too. Besides having written a wonderful book on LGBT refugees in the UK, Calogero Giametta also checked my English for this presentation. Thanks, Calogero. Um, I leave you with these precious words, a post that the comrades of uh, Transmissão, a Portuguese trans and non-binary association, published in August on their Facebook after a trans boy committed suicide. I decided to leave it in its original language, but I tried to translate it for you. They say, in the last days, unfortunately, we have witnessed the worst consequences of the isolation of trans people are left us, and it is only by luck that another comrade is still among us. To see beyond these circumstances, to meet in order to live together in community, to laugh and to let off steam with people who understand us, is essential to our balance. So we invite you to share this picnic with us. Be there. Thanks, Transmissão, for letting me use this text, and thanks to you for listening.